Uh, well, th thank you very much for that um, introduction, Glenn. Um, I, was, I, was, I was out um, having dinner last night at a party, and someone asked me what I was doing tomorrow morning, and I said I was going to be talking about uh, barcoding standards. Well, it's not really a sort of conversation ripper, is it, barcoding <laughs> standards? Um, but if I'd said I'm talking about the transformation of the NHS, uh, which in fact is what it is all about, then it would have been um, probably would have gone down, gone down better. I, I went to um, Derby, the hospital at Derby, um, about three weeks ago, and met with Kevin and Keith, who who I think gave a, a presentation yesterday. And I have to say, I was really blown away by what I saw in Derby. I mean, what can be achieved by something as prosaic as barcoding standards, which in many industries is just taken for granted you know, many years ago. You know, what can be achieved in terms of standardization, in terms of patient safety, in terms of, uh, of getting some really uh, deep and accurate costing around clinical practice um, can be a hugely important part of the, of the future um, of, of the NHS. I, I wanted to start by... Um, giving a little bit of context about, you know, why this is important. You know, if you read the Daily Mail or in any of our newspapers, um, you might think that the NHS um, is in really bad shape, that it's run by a bunch of incompetents. Actually, I, don't, I want to start off by saying I think that much of the management of the NHS is absolutely world class. Um, it is fashionable to write it off. But actually, running hospitals is massively complex. And all, all people here, whether you're clinicians or, or in management, will know just how difficult it is to run a hospital or indeed a healthcare system as we move more into systems and away from institutions. It requires a huge amount of skill to, to run a great hospital. And just, um, if I could just start off with just a couple of slides to illustrate that. that um, and I'll, just, I'll whip through these very quickly. You can, you can see that for what it is. Actually, the NHS is still the, by far the most powerful brand. Um, in the, it withstands enormous criticism, and yet the NHS is still probably the most powerful brand, not just in the UK, but around the world. You go anywhere around the world and talk about the NHS. It is a massively highly regarded um, organisation. Um, and that was the Commonwealth Fund. I mean, what is interesting about this slide is that we are ranked first for efficiency. Now, you can query whether how you know, the Commonwealth Fund, the methodology behind this, but um, you know, by, by most world standards, the NHS is right up, up there at the top. And we do that um, with very little money. Um, you know, we spend consistently 20% less than the European countries that we would compare ourselves with, Germany, France, the Netherlands, and very much, very much less than um, what they spend in, in the USA. So we are not saying, I think, I would never say that the NHS is grossly inefficient and there's a lot more we can get. What I would say is, is that the NHS is an efficient system which can do better. And I think that will be true if I was standing here as the chief executive of Toyota, I would say the same thing. You know, we are a good company, we can do better. And uh, that is really what I think, um, that is the context within which I think we should see um, the work that you're doing in, in GS1 uh, around uh, barcoding standards. And the reason why, the fundamental reason why we have got to realize um, more efficiency in our acute hospitals is because we have to move away to uh, uh, very much an acute bias system of care in the UK uh, to a system where much more care is delivered outside acute hospital settings. And that argument is not actually really based around cost. Um, it's based around the population that we are serving today, which is a very different one from one that we were serving um, in 1948 or indeed even in, in 2000. But it's interesting, if you just notice that first quote on the top, you know, that was made in 2000. That was the NHS plan in 2000. So for 15 years, you know, there's been a recognition um, that the system of care, the way we deliver care um, in England, it, uh, needs to change. And I think this is, a, um, this is, I think, of all the sort of slides I was going to show today, in a way, this is the most sort of telling, I think, that... <laughs> Despite the fact that we've known that we must move care outside acute hospitals um, into the community, into primary care, 
um, actually everything that we have done since 2000 through successive governments of different colours has actually had the effect of driving more care into acute hospitals. You know, the A&E 4R target, um, foundation trusts, um, payment by results, uh, elective waiting time targets, it's all had the effect of driving more resources into hospitals. And you can see that there's been an 82% rise in hospital consultants over that time um, compared to 22% of GPs and, <coughs> and even less for um, nurses working in, in uh, district, uh, uh, district nurses and um, community matrons. And that's at a time when lifestyle diseases, demographics, and the growth in long-term conditions has really should have been driving more care outside acute hospitals. So we are now at a time when money is very tight. Uh, the real growth in money for the NHS since 2010 to 2020 is going to be growing at about 1% real. That compares with 4 or 5% real for most of the time of the NHS. So money is going to be tight. Uh, we've got to put more resources into the community and into mental health. The only place we can get those resources is by running our acute hospitals uh, more efficiently. And we know that by well standards, they're already efficient. So we have got to take an efficient system um, and make it much better. Now, um, Lord Carter's report um, identified £5 billion of opportunities um, that can be realised from, uh, from uh, higher uh, clinical, clinical productivity. I think it's just worth just dwelling on, I think, really probably the most important issue that, um, that, we, that we face is how do you get improvement and change into an organisation like the NHS? Now, we have used targets, and of course targets have a, have a role, uh, but the perverse effect of targets we all know about, you know, the skewed clinical priorities, the lack of clinical engagement in many of those um, targets, um, the gaming that goes around targets. Uh, we've tried decentralization to try and get greater what we would call earned autonomy through foundation trusts and CCGs. But of course the perverse impact of that, the unintended consequence is that it makes it much more difficult to deliver an integrated system of care because everyone's looking after their own patch. We've tried top-down performance management. Uh, we've tried choice, we've tried competition. But actually, the market does not work in healthcare. I mean, the market is so imperfect that we can never rely upon the market in the way that you can in retailing or in, in motor car manufacture. And we've tried regulation through financial regulation, monitor, quality regulation from the CQC. And of course, you end up then with a, with a culture much more around compliance uh, than improvement. So where it leaves me, having been in the NHS and having sort of lived through all these different methods of improvement that we have tried, and I've been in the, in the NHS now since um, 2001, is that I think that the, the way forward is to, is, is to expose unwarranted variation. And one of the reasons why I believe that that is the most powerful lever for improvement is that I think it is the only way that we all get true clinical engagement. Because without clinical engagement, if we can't win the trust of clinicians, and if we can't engage clinicians, we'll never get real improvement, sustainable improvement. We may get short-term improvement through, 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 through targets, for example. We may get short-term improvement by a tougher uh, regulatory system. But actually, to get long-term sustainable improvement, uh, we have to get clinical engagement. And I, 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 was, I was in um, uh, Massachusetts General Hospital um, about three weeks ago. And the chief operating officer of MassGen, who actually is a statistician and a doctor by background, and I was talking to him about how they got improvement in MassGen. And he said it was all about incremental, incrementally attack, uh, attacking variation. And he said the first thing, when you show the, a, a group of clinicians what their results are, they will say, we don't believe the information. We don't believe the data. And he said, you have to go back time and again to prove to clinicians that the data is good. And actually, if you're apportioning data or, you're, or, or you have, as we do in England, you know, reference costs that you know, are just not sufficiently granular or accurate, the clinicians will always say, we don't believe you. 
And actually, and you can't blame them for saying that because they're right. And I think that what uh, the barcoding project, GS1 project does, it starts to build the argument. And that's not to say that all variation is wrong. There's lots of reasons for variation, good reasons for variation. But you can start to have the argument. I just put a couple of examples here. This, this is just um, interesting. This is on prostate cancer, actually. And I just looked at the Martini Clinic in, uh, in, in Germany, which is a very specialist. Um, um, they do many, many radical prostatectomies. Um, at the Martini Clinic, you know, the, if the, the, the key thing you want to know if you're a man and you're having a, a prostate operation is whether or not in, you know, you're going to be either impotent or incontinent. And just the difference in outcomes from this specialist clinic compared to other German hospitals who are not specialist is so stark uh, that it just, I thought it would be worth just sharing it with you. And again, I looked at an example in the US around lung cancer survival rates. Again. This is the kind of variation. Now, you can get this down to clinician to, or to teams of clinicians or multidisciplinary teams or, or by hospital. But this, is, this kind of information is what I believe drives improvement because clinicians are interested in this. Uh, clinicians are competitive animals. They want to be better than other hospitals or other departments or other colleagues. And I think exposing this kind of variation is very, is very powerful. And this is just another one that um, actually Tim Briggs, Professor Briggs gave me, who's um, head of um, a trauma orthopedics at Stanmore, doing a lot of work with the Carter team around uh, variation. This is just looking at the cost of prosthetics. I mean, the, the variation in the cost or the price of prosthetics bears no relationship to the volumes used in hospitals. And you know, I'll bet you, you know, dollars to donuts that you go into any of those hospitals, there's 15 hospitals on this slide, uh, all the people there will think they're getting the best deal. Um, because that's the way it is. I mean, companies like Johnson & Johnson and others are geared up to exploit the fragmentation across the NHS. You know, again, if we can use barcoding to help us aggregate our purchasing um, decisions, we can drive some very, very significant improvements on, on pricing. So, turning, turning more directly to, to, to GSI, I mean, I, I, I really don't think I can say much more than what has already been told to you by, um, by Kevin and Keith and others yesterday and what you'll hear later on today. But the, the benefits for procurement uh, for patient safety are, are manifest. But I, I come back to, again, and this is my, the big takeaway for me from when I went to Derby, that the real importance or the real, um, the real impact that we'll have from GS1 is around clinical productivity uh, through uh, and, and greater clinical engagement. I mean, if you can tell um, a group of consultants, look, you know, the cost of your consumables for the same operation is 50% more than someone else. If you can say you took much, that much more time and you can actually show them that the, these results and your readmission rates are this. And of course, it will improve your coding as well within hospitals. You'll get much more accurate coding so you can charge the right amount to the CCGs. And of course, your, your mortality rights, your HSMR and the like will also be uh, much more accurate. So I think there's a huge amount to go for if you can do this. Um, but you'll only do it if you get clinicians to work with you. And that's why I think the, the, the presentation that Kevin and Keith gave you yesterday, which is the finance director and the clinician, you know, working together is where you'll get um, the real benefits. Um, there is a, there's always a danger in the NHS, is that someone has a new idea, a great idea, um, and you can just plonk it into a system and it will work. And, and it absolutely won't. Um, I, I was sent uh, a paper by um, Jennifer Dixon at the uh, Healthcare Foundation yesterday by um, Stephen Spears. He's looked at Toyota. And there are a lot of people who, in the NHS who go around saying, we, we must do what Toyota does. We must put, we must put lean into our, into our hospital. Um, and it just doesn't happen like that. You just don't put lean into your hospital. And equally, you don't just put um, GS1 into your hospital. It's not something you can bolt on. It's, this is not an IT project or a, 
or a finance department project or a purchasing project, um, if we're going to um, really embed um, GS1 and barcoding uh, into hospitals, uh, we have to accept that this is a behavioral sort of cultural issue, uh, not a technological issue. I mean, interesting, this Stephen Spear, who, who's done this work on Toyota, you know, concluded actually that technology is not where you get sustainable competitive advantage. Is where you get sustainable competitive advantage in an organization is where you have behavior in an organization, a culture in an organization, um, which is always open to, to improvements, new learning, um, to innovation. And I think what I saw at Derby, and I'm sure I would see it if I went to the other demonstrator sites as well, is that if you do have clinicians who are part of the team, who are leading the team, and see the real value in GS1, then we've got a real chance of getting it established. But if we regard it as another good idea from head office that can be sort of just put into a hospital, then, then it will never work. Now, I think the, the clinical arguments are so strong uh, that we have, a, you know, we have a very good chance of winning that argument with, with clinicians and in hospitals. Uh, and I think if we do, we will take a big step towards greater standardization, um, better care. I think also, interestingly, as we move forwards and we look at service line reconfiguration, we're going to need to have a real handle on our costs. You know, we're going to need, need to know what the costs of hip replacements are in Derby compared to what they are at Burton or, or at Norfolk and Norwich compared to what they are at the James Paget and that this will really drive improvement throughout the NHS. So from the point of view of myself and the Department of Health, I'd just like to thank all those six um, demonstrator sites, but actually all the other hospitals that are really taking this seriously, and anything that we can do to help you on this journey to um, implementing GS1 and, and indeed PEPOL, um, we're right behind you. Thank you very much.